Gearbox Talk is coming in hot with a show that'll freeze you to your core. We're talking about ice fishing again today. We're going back to the Go Wild Well. We're bringing in a community member, Jay Hale, this time, and he's going to talk about ice fishing. Jay's been ice fishing his whole life. He brings a wealth of experience and knowledge to the show. This guy's a natural on, on the show, actually. We're diving into the basics. We'll give yet another perspective on how to get started ice fishing. I've learned a lot over these last two ice fishing shows, whether it was Jimmy or Jay. If, if you like learning about new outdoor topics, let's hit subscribe. Every single week, I'm having awesome conversations like this one. We're, we're talking about a wide range of topics too. It's fishing, it's hunting, archery, shooting, self-defense, and beyond. So don't miss out. Go ahead and hit subscribe right now. All right, grab the auger and a cold one. It's time to dig in. This is Gearbox Talk with Jay Hale. Jay Hale, you just told me you've got close to four decades, or around four decades of your life ice fishing. So I'm excited to get some advice from you. And it's not like you're you're not necessarily like a pro or anything. You've just done this your whole life. You love it. And I'm excited to get some advice for someone who's a beginner and trying to get into it. How's it going, man? Absolutely. It's going great, Brad. Thanks for having me on. All right, man. Let's dive into it. Let's talk about picking a spot to drill. How do you go about this? And then I'm curious what your auger of choice is. Sure. So uh, the way I pick spots, uh, if it's a new piece of water, what I do is I look to see where other people have been. You can learn a lot by kind of watching what other people are up to. Um, if there's not people on the ice, you can just walk around looking for holes. The holes really aren't going to disappear anywhere. But if you're familiar with fishing the pond open water, some of those same tactics with structure and stuff will still kind of work uh, when it's frozen over. So that's what I do. Um, I, or if you, you know, know some people who fish that pond out through the ice, just ask them. A lot of people are always willing to kind of give you suggestions, point you in the right direction. They may not give you a honey hole, some submerged tree that bait fish are hanging out on, but they'll give you an idea. Oh, awesome. Some just came up. <laughs> That's all right. And then I know, uh, you know, with the, with the auger, you know, there's hand cranks, there's motorized. What, what's your preference on, on an auger? Sure. A lot of the ponds that I fish are very residential ponds. So the last thing somebody wants you to do if you're getting out there before sunrise is crank up a gas powered, uh, <laughs> you know, power auger at like six, six thirty in the morning. So what I've been using pretty much most of the time is a strike master Mora auger. It's a hand crank. It's an eight inch blade. Um, if you're interested in getting one of these, my recommendation is to look for the blades that were made in Sweden. A lot of the ones that are made now uh, are made in China and they just don't seem to be as durable. So uh, you can still find some of the ones made in Sweden and I would definitely go with those. Uh, I've used this, it's, it's a pretty good auger. If your blades are nice and thick, you can get through a foot of ice with very, very minimal effort. Um, but if you know somebody with a power auger, it makes, if you're drilling a lot of holes, it makes life a lot easier, but it's not necessary. And even, if you can find a place that people were fishing not too long ago that hasn't been that cold, you can also get uh, an ice fishing spud. I think this one's, yeah, this one's made by Frable. So basically what it is, is a big chisel. You, you can, uh, if someone was fishing there the day before and there's a little bit of skim ice, just use one of these things, tap out the holes, boom, put your stuff in there, you're ready to go. And it's also great to have one of these things just for ice safety. Uh, as you venture out into the frozen lake or the pond, just you can chisel away if it goes straight through turn around get off so, oh, that's a good um, good tip there okay cool yeah. um you know another thing that you know we always look at what are people looking for for this show what are people trying to learn about and there's a lot of people asking what are tip-ups and why should you use them can you talk through your tip-ups uh selection sure so like you were saying i've been at it for 40 years the first tip-up i got was very very rudimentary this uh hand me down it's still got my name on here somewhere so this is from I think my dad said the 1950s and it kind of advanced a bit. One of the ones I like to get, they're relatively inexpensive. This one is made by, I think this is also made by H by HT. It's called the hard water Explorer. So a tip up is basically, it's also called a fish trap. What it is is you put it over your hole, you bait it down here. It has a small spool, like a reel. Um, 
You can use live bait or artificial bait with it. I like to hold them up with a piece of Velcro, keeps the hooks from getting all tangled up. So you put your live bait or artificial bait on that, set it in the ice, you know, you find a depth uh, where you think the fish are going to be. If you're fishing for trout, sometimes it's right under the ice. If you're fishing for something else, it might be right off the bottom. The fish grabs the hook with the bait on it, and then it flings up this flag, which is a little too big for my camera, and it lets you know that it is up. Uh, what I like about this brand is, you can see here, it has a drag on it. So if you're fishing, I, I do do a decent amount of, uh, of fishing for trout under the ice with uh, night crawlers or worms, and you can loosen the drag up because like, if a trout feels any bit of resistance, it's going to drop the bait immediately. So with this hard water explorer, you can really loosen this screw on the drag right there, and boom, it, you know, mm. very little re resistance. And uh, when you're fighting the, the the fish on that, you kind of set the hook with a with a uh, a yank of the line right there, and then just kind of hand over hand fish uh, fight the fish back through the hole. And these these tip ups are good. I've used them for for anything from trout and panfish to pike. But I also have another tip up that I use here for larger fish, pike, lakers. This is ah, this is the Heritage Tackle. Uh, that's the brand on that. It's kind of local to me. It's made in Maine. Uh, you can start to get these more in big box stores. It also has a spool. The drag is a little more serious. I don't like it as much for trout. I've had a hard time kind of getting it to the the uh, loose enough where they're not feeling tension. But this thing is a killer for lake trout, and I love it for pike. I've caught a lot of pike in Vermont with these things. I'm uh, curious. The thing about tip-ups is you have to be careful with your regulations. Uh, where I live in Massachusetts, you're allowed five ice fishing devices. So that could be either a, a jig rod and four tip-ups. New Hampshire has six. Vermont has different ones. Like if you're fishing on a large lake like Lake Champlain, I think you can have something like 12 out there. So just keep an eye on your regulations. Uh, a tip-up counts as an ice fishing device. So um, that will let you know how many of these you can get. But the, uh, the Hard Water Explorer is great for a beginner. It costs under $20. So if you're looking to get started, it's not really that big of an investment. And and what's the, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the jig. Like, is that just based on what species you're targeting on which tactic you're using? Yeah. Uh, well, I, what I typically do on my ice fishing spread is I'll use, in Massachusetts, I'll just kind of keep it simple with that. So I will use the four tip-ups with a jig rod. But if I have a lot, and I use the live bait, which is typically Arkansas shiners, or if I trap my own bait, like uh, small pumpkin seed fish, you know, depending on what's legal in your state. Uh, live bait is usually the shiners. You can pick up at any bait store. And uh, I'll use those. It just, through the ice, that seems like it's the most effective. Um, I do a lot of bass fishing through the ice, bass, pickerel, perch, and they'll just go nuts in the winter for, uh, for live bait. Uh, it's really effective with that. I was going to ask you about, um, you know, you kind of mentioned live bait, but also with tackle selection, you know, uh, you, you take your top species or two and, and let's talk through your tackle choices when you're not using live bait. Sure. Uh, when I'm not using live bait, I would say my overall, my overall favorite lure is a 12th ounce uh, uh, <laughs> cast master, it's okay. Acme cast master. Uh, my favorite, this one, I couldn't find one still in the package because I just go through them so quickly. Uh, my favorite one is the 12 ounce gold. Uh, it catches everything from, I've caught horn pout, uh, catfish up to lake trout with them. Uh, I've caught a, on an eighth ounce cast master, I caught a really nice, uh, land, uh, brood stock landlocked salmon that the state used to stock in there just on a tiny little jig rod. And that'll catch anything. Most forge I would say most forage in Massachusetts are either going to be something small like smelt size where this 12 ounce cast master is just deadly, or it's something more like these slug bugs uh, made by Northland. Yeah, these are really effective too. You just kind of set it at a 90 degree angle on your jig rod and just gently because they're going after like uh, blood worms. That's one of the big forage fish for like panfish, crappie, uh, sunfish, perch. Um, that little Northland jig is just, that's also deadly on panfish. I use that a lot. Um, awesome. My favorite color on that is probably red because that's that's a little closer to the, to the forage base. Awesome. 
And I'm, I, you know, one thing that I see a lot of debate around, of course, is the shelter out on the ice. So I'm, I'm comp- uh, you've done this for a long time. I'm curious for your approach on the shelter, and this, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, the sled in a second. But you know, the shelter itself. What's your approach? How uh, I'm sure this varies per location too a little bit. But tell us a little bit about your approach to the shelter. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I started ice fishing again after uh, you know I went to college, I was living in downtown Boston in an apartment. So keeping a lot of gear in that apartment was <laughs> difficult. Uh, and then just for me, as someone who's like really mobile and only had a Honda Accord at the time, it was tough to put a sled, my gear, bait bucket, and a shelter in there. So I've never really fished that often with a shelter. I'm sure they're great, but um, it never really justified the expense. When I'm out on the ice with all these tip-ups, I set them very far apart. Mm. Uh, and I'm constantly in motion out there. So I'm always staying warm and there's ways to kind of make wind breaks if you're out, um, if you're out on the, uh, on the lake, but shelters are great. If you have the space, if you have a friend, if you want to pitch in with a buddy, they're great to have. I've just never fished with them. Um, yeah. And a lot of the places I fish are, are, are pretty small and it's always been just a, a cost and a space thing. So if I'm, you're just I'm, starting off, I'd say that's one thing to sacrifice at, at, at first I think, yeah, that's great really advice. In, yeah. If you get really involved in ice fishing, you know, consider it. Yeah. I, when I, when I talked to Jimmy, you know, I was kind of surprised at how affordable a shelter was, but again, when you're getting into something, you don't know if you want to, you're going to stick with it. That's, that's, even if it's not too expensive, it's still a heck of a commitment size wise. Right. Like you said, if you're in an right. apartment or you're going to have to drive this thing around in a Honda Accord, <laughs> it's like, let's not do that. You know, let's, yeah, let's, exactly. uh, let's try it out a few times. I am curious though. And I didn't ask you about this before, so I know you aren't prepped to show anything, but what clothing are like, do you have a, a setup that you prefer on staying? Like if it's super cold, like whatever, sub zero, you know, you know, you're going to yeah, freeze your I butt mean, off. What do you go with? What I normally do is I, 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 just keep it cheap, man. I'll go to a store like Marshall's, one of those discount stores. I'm sure Sierra Trading Post would be killer for this. They just really didn't have them when I was buying myself. It's just, uh, you know, I'll wear a pair of fleece line jeans, uh, a pair of just regular cheap ski snow pants, um, any, it, 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 a, just a warm winter coat. It doesn't have to be down. I have, I got one from Old Navy. It's this big goofball, puffy camouflage, shiny jacket, but it's super thick. And, uh, it really, really does the trick. It's been my official ice fishing jacket for probably at least a decade. My wife hates it, but uh, I, I think it's great. It <laughs> does the trick. But any any clothing you have for cold weather deer hunting, it's going to be perfect. It's yeah. going to be perfect. Uh, and I'll throw it keep- out there. Cause this is something I have done, which is be, be mm-hmm. cold. Uh, you know, I deer hunt and I've, I've yeah. hunted not quite like you guys do up further North, but in single digits, you know, uh, the thing I've, I've found with layering for anybody that's new to being out for a long time in the cold, um, layers of, of clothing, like you mentioned down, like that are going to create air pockets, like getting that air gap and to have some space that can be heated is really important. And then you kind of, uh, mentioned a couple different ways to layer there also having something that's going to break the wind if you have a combo of those two things because uh you know sometimes you're down i have a down jacket that i love uh or uh, it's not a down it's like a synthetic down but i love the jacket but it does not break wind so if you combine that with something that breaks the wind and also creates an air gap you're going to be fine you're going to be warm so and just one thing to consider if you are uh using something down Use something you can get fish slime on and easily mm. wash it. The more machine <laughs> washable, the better. Um, I have a great down jacket, but I kind of relegated it to shoveling the driveway because I don't. It's hand wash only, and I don't want to get pickled slime on it. Yeah, dude. The bad. some of those puffy jackets. Actually, even my puffy jacket. It, when I wash it, it all gets like knotted up, and then I have to spend twenty mm-hmm. minutes pulling it all back through the coat and it works fine once you do that, but it is super annoying because it's, it's not right. very, uh, it's, it's not very washable in that sense. All right, man. Now I'm curious though, you, uh, you, you still got a lot of gear. So even though you don't take a shelter, you got to get all this stuff out there. Let's talk through your, your sled transport for all this equipment. Yep. So one thing you can use if you're just going to go at it real, real simple, trusty five gallon bucket, you know, you can put all your tip ups in this, Whatever you need, carry it out there, no problem. Um, if you have something else to put your gear in, bait bucket. It's cheap. But what I've been using is um, just an, this is a jet sled or an otter sled. I'm pretty sure it's a jet sled. Um, 
It doesn't have to be covered in punk rock stickers. <laughs> yeah, we got to get you a Go Wild sticker, man. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I got one on my fridge, but not on the sled. Um, so this is this doubles as my deer sled. Uh, pretty oh, empty yeah. this year, sad to yeah. say. A little bit of blood in there, but not much. Uh, yeah, so I just use that. I got this one. It's one of the smaller ones because... You know, so I say it's shorter than I thought. So they, they yeah. obviously got some various size options there. Yeah, this one, this one I bought uh, just to fit in the trunk of that Honda Accord. Yeah, and I've just kind of—it's the perfect size for my hand auger. My hand auger breaks down into two pieces. Um, I keep my tip ups now. This is from a company called HT. My dad got me this for Christmas a few years ago. Mm. Um, it's almost disintegrated. It's just like a little bag. You can keep your tip ups, yeah. your jig rod, and your lures in. Um, I've used an old uh, softball catcher's equipment bag to lug my uh, tip ups around in. I've used old duffel bags. Um, but going back to the sled, if you don't want to invest in a jet sled and you're not a deer hunter and you don't need a drag sled just get, get one of these toboggans yeah this is what i started with you know before jet sleds sleds were a thing back in the 80s this is what my family used to transport all of our gear one of these cheapo plastic toboggans um i got this for my son he's too small for this now but i got this in february at walmart for three bucks <laughs> so say like 12 bucks or less you probably can have your sled situation yeah. taken care so, of <laughs> Yeah, they work. They work perfect. Um, you might want to put a bungee cord over it so your gear doesn't flop off if you hit a bump in the ice. But they yeah. work really, really well. Nice. I mean, what I love about getting into ice fishing after talking to two of you guys about this, it's so cheap to get into. I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. sub hundred dollars. You can go out and try your first go at ice fishing. You know, you string together your your clothing you already have. You you don't have to go out and buy you know six sets of tip ups to try it. It's a very affordable thing to try this winter if you're new. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can get good deals on used gear on Craigslist or whatever aftermarket site you have in, in your community. Um, you know, after the season, everybody's looking to unload stuff, you know, either old model stuff or whatever. Um, I found plenty of stuff at yard sales. Nice. Nice. Uh, I'm curious. I'll ask you out of everything that you're using ice fishing, what's your favorite piece of gear? Ooh, man. I don't know. I, I really like, Compared to the garbage that I used to fish with when I was really, really little, all these terrible hand-me-downs from like the Depression era, the, the new tip-ups, the new tip-ups are really, really nice. I, I just love the fact that there's drags on them. Um, I haven't really invested in a quality jig rod. I'll just go to a big box store and you can get a rod. Um, I might have it up here. Yeah. I don't even know what brand this is. I don't even know if it has a brand. Uh, it's just a cheap little. Oh, it's made by HT. There we go. It's just a, a cheap little rod. Cost me $9.99. It came with a reel that was 100% plastic, so I took it right off. Just take your open water reel, open water reel, and just electrical tape it on there. It uh -huh. works fine. Um, and then when open water season opens back up, just take it off. That's what I've been doing for 15 years. And back in the day, we used to take the tips from old open water uh, rods and just electrical tape a reel onto that, and that worked just fine. So that's another way to kind of, if you're a beginner and you don't want to invest the 20 to 25 bucks on a, on a jig rod, you can just do that. It's just real simple, simple stuff. Awesome, man. Jay, this was really good. I appreciate you coming on and sharing four decades of knowledge, and, and <laughs> hopefully uh, you know, we're going to get this in front of some newbies and they can try ice fishing for the first time this year. Dude, thanks so much. No problem. All right, take care. Thank you, Jay. All right, that was an awesome show. Remember, the gear mentioned is in the show notes. So if you click any of those links and buy it, we make money. If we make money, we donate a percentage of our money back into Raising My Door. So literally, when you buy the gear through Gearbox Talk, you can help give to a camp that teaches kids how to hunt, fish, hike, camp, all that good stuff. You buy, the kids get more funding. It's that simple. You know, this is our first full show of 2021, and I just want to say make sure you subscribe. I have some plans with some big names. I'm talking absolute rock stars in the outdoor industry. I can't tell you who just yet, but these people are gracing magazine covers. They're hitting all the top shelf podcasts, and they're on your favorite TV shows. Seriously, this is going to be a big year for Gearbox Talk. You do not want to miss it, so hit that subscribe button right now, whether you're on YouTube or the podcast. That's it for me today. Thanks for stopping by. I'm out.